remain standing or stand up if you're not standing. Turn with me to Micah chapter 6. And even while I'm about to read, beginning at verse number 1, I have been pastoring for 20 years, 15 years at this wonderful church here in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And in 20 years of pastoring, I've never preached any type of voting or political messages leading up to an election. And I feel that there's such a spirit of darkness over our nation that I'm required prophetically to speak to that demon. And I'm learning in my own life, y'all. This is a good word for somebody. I'm going to read Micah 6 beginning at verse 1 in a minute. But I'm learning in my own life, demons don't like to be chastised. Demons don't like to be talked to. Demons don't like to be corrected. And the way you really deal with a demon is speak to them. It, listen, what gets rid of darkness immediately is light. And so I'm here to put the light on. And so I'm in this series of sermons on voting the values of Jesus. Today I want to preach about Jesus and justice. Jesus and justice. Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment, this is very important, against his people. And he will contend with Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what? Shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Say amen if you can. And have your seats as we get ready to unpack this. I want to preach today about Jesus and justice. Too often times we are accustomed to thinking of the Christian faith in terms of believing only certain things about Jesus. We want to limit, we want to limit or reduce Jesus to simply being about our receiving Jesus as Savior, being baptized becoming a church member, reading the Bible, going to church, all of the spiritual aspects of salvation. And too often we forget that the Bible is actually calling us to be concerned with more issues than simply escaping hell and making it to heaven. The Christian life we have reduced our walk with Christ to just checking off all of the right theological and doctrinal positions. And the Bible says, what does God really want of us? What is really the mission that's set before us as believers? Micah addresses the question. Micah is one of those ancient Israel prophetic writers that we would refer to as the minor prophets. 
They are the minor prophets not because of the character or the theological depth of their message, but they are the minor prophets because of the relationship of the length of their messages compared to the other prophets like Isaiah. These smaller prophets, these smaller texts were oftentimes gathered together in one scroll. And sometimes the Israelites, the Jews, will refer to these scrolls, stay close, I want to just set this up, with the book of 12. Micah is one of these books of 12. His words come to us during a period following Babylonian exile. The, 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 the setting of the text is with the exile as the main event in the life of the nation. And we find here that children of Israel, those he's writing to, they are familiar with the idea of Israel. Watch this. They're familiar with Israel and Judah being unfaithful to Yahweh. They're used to the language of during and after Babylonian exile that the people that were supposed to be faithful to God were not. The problem is, is how we define their unfaithfulness. We oftentimes assume the unfaithfulness that's talked about is I don't pray. I don't worship. I don't give. But when you start looking at the book of 12, the scroll of the minor prophets, and then weave into that in concert with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I'm going somewhere. This is going to get tough right now. He says, your unfaithfulness is not characterized in how you worship. Your faithfulness or unfaithfulness is being characterized by your practice of economic injustice toward poor and the disenfranchised. See, we have this little tendency to think that if it's about social justice, it's really not biblical or spiritual. We tend to think that the Old Testament doesn't know anything about God's concerns for social justice. We tend to believe that spiritual matters, watch this, are unrelated issues to economics. As long as I pray, what difference does it make if I don't feed the hungry? As long as I sing on the choir, so what? That when I leave the choir loft and go to my business that I run, that I don't pay you a just wage. The problem with the historical tendencies of the church is that first we contradict the way Jesus actually lived the way Jesus actually ministered, the way Jesus actually spoke. And too often times, the test of the Old Testament, and we see here is this expectation that, 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 that there is no relationship between how I serve God and how I deal with you. Stay close, I'm going somewhere. When we start talking about redemption, when you start reading the Old Testament and the prophetic writings, we don't just see the themes of the redemption of salvation, salvation. We see the redemption of slaves. We see the caring for poor people. We see the giving justice to widows. We see standing up for orphans. We see treating immigrants with dignity. All of that pervades the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament. Micah is probably, apart from the Psalms, don't worry, I got a long introduction, but just two points. Here in the Old Testament, apart from the Psalms, Micah is probably one of the most quoted passages of all the Bible. Too often times, we fail to take into account that God is not addressing heathens. I'm going to take my time with this. God is not saying I'm bothered with neo-Nazis. God is not speaking a word about Antifa. 
There's nothing in here about white supremacy. There's nothing in here about KKK. He says, my issue is people that call my name and then do my people wrong. He is addressing the fact that the people of God have divorced themselves. Watch this. They have divorced themselves from economic and social demands in the name of spirituality. Micah was addressing a people who very pointedly were not making the connection between God's requirements on a legal and economic level with God's demands as they consider a more spiritual and religious life. Y'all need me to just give it to you straight, I can tell. Almost every book of the Bible addresses economic relationships. There is no way to love your neighbor as yourself if you are stealing from them. We cannot demonstrably care for one another if we remain blind to the forms of injustice that are prevalent in our society. Let me say it like this. The Great Commission, go into all the world. Without the Great Commandment, love your neighbor as yourself is a great catastrophe. I'm going to say it again. The Great Commandment, the Great Commission, without the Great Commandment, is a great catastrophe. When love, watch this, is detached from truth, then love loses its influence. We forget that our greatest weapon is still the love of Jesus. I want to say two things today. The first thing that I want us to be mindful for is that we all, if we're Christians, have first and foremost an accountability to Jesus. My problem with when we preachers and prophets quote Micah 6, 6 through 8, we divorce ourselves from the context of the, few, the, the previous verses. We, we, we forget what is laid out for us beginning in chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And when we begin looking at chapter 6, verse 1, what we start to see is this story that's brought forth between Balaam and Balak. Very rarely when you hear, what does the Lord require of you, do you also hear anything about Balaam and Balak? But the reality of it is verses 6 through 8 are in the context of the verses 1 through 5, which is the story in Numbers 22 about Balak and Balaam. Stay close. What was the story, Pastor? I don't remember. Balaam was a hired prophet. Y'all going to catch that in a minute. Balak is king of Moab. The king of Moab always needs somebody that claims they love God to get on their payroll. So Balak approaches Balaam as a hired prophet. He said, I got a problem with God's people. I need you stand up behind me when I get my speech. I'm sorry he didn't say that. I need you. Now y'all understand why there's always a higher prophet behind the president, I mean the king. He says, I'm tired of God's people. I want you to curse them. He said, I can't do that because they blessed. He said, well, can you try? He said, let me go talk to God about it. He goes back. He talks to God. God is like, man, I can't do that. You know those are my people. He goes a second time and then a third time. Finally, because he's a higher prophet and he cares more about the money than he does the people and God, he relinquishes and he gets on his donkey. He gets on his donkey and he's going to go to this spot where he's going to make up in his mind to curse God's people. 
And this should bless somebody because every time he opened up his mouth to try to curse them, all that kept coming back was God saying, but I told you they were blessed. And I want to encourage somebody. I don't care how many folk try to curse you. If God says you are blessed, if God says you are standing, if God says you're all right, if God says everything is going to work out, don't worry about what folks say about you. What matters is not what the higher prophet says. What matters is what God says. And so I got, I got to get back, back to the text. But what happens is, what happens is, he gets on his donkey, he starts going down and curse the people. And, 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 and the donkey sees the roadblock by an angel and veers off the road. The prophet gets off the donkey and starts beating the donkey. Puts the donkey back on the road. Second time, he does the same thing. He veers off. He beats the donkey. Third time, he does the same thing. I'm trying to help somebody. He beats the donkey. Then the Bible says, God says, you know what? Let me give the donkey speech. Since you won't use your voice the way I want you to use your voice, I'll give speech to a donkey to be able to use its voice. So then the donkey looks at the prophet and be like, how many years you been riding me? Since when have I done you wrong? Since when have I not done what you wanted me to do? Do you not recognize him? Help y'all. Some of y'all don't want to listen to the prophet, so God will send a donkey. God will send somebody that you think shouldn't even be talking to you. You think don't even make any sense, and God will use them as a way of it. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to God all those times I got stuck on stupid and absent and didn't want to do what God said. God sent somebody my way to speak a word of wisdom and a word. A word of truth. Is there anybody worshiping today that could look back over your life and say, God, thank you that when I was veering off my path, you sent somebody in my life to set me straight. So he comes back. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. He comes back. And and the king of Moab is like, well, well, what happened? You can't cuss him? He said, man, I can't. So he says, all right, tell you what, what do I need to do? Now you're in Micah 6. What can I do to get in good standing with God? Since he won't fight with me and for me, what can I do? Now you're in the text now. He says, he says, he says, uh, With what can I come before the Lord? Chapter 6, verse 6. Well, can can I bring him burnt offerings? Can, can, Can I bring him calf a year old? Can I preach a better sermon? What what about a thousand rams? What about my best solo? What about I don't serve once a month, I serve twice a month? Y'all going to catch it in a minute. Okay, I got it. I'm going to stop giving. I'm going to stop giving 5%. I'm going to start giving 10. What about my firstborn for all of my transgression? I'll put my child in the nursery. I'll make sure my child is active in youth ministry. I will participate in a small group. What can I do to get right with God? He says, I told you what I required of you. Y'all don't want to talk. But to do justly. (sighs) Y'all, I'm struggling with people who claim to be conservatives but liberally resist God. It's exactly why we had slavery. We had slavery because people that claim the name of Jesus, who half read their Bible, used a few texts that they misinterpreted to support their position and ignored the bulk of the scriptures and the bulk of the Bible that talked about addressing human oppression. question is still relevant today. 
Stay close, y'all. God, what do you require of me? I'm struggling here, God. God, this is what he's saying, y'all. What God requires of me goes beyond my blackness. What God requires of me goes beyond my whiteness. I don't have help, but I'm committed to this sermon series. What God requires of me goes beyond my party affiliation. What God requires of me goes beyond my affinity group. God does not care if you are fiscally conservative, if you don't do justly. See, let me tell you what God is saying. I'm trying to take my people beyond situational ethics. God said, I know y'all. Tell your neighbor, he knows you. He knows you. Somebody, come on, out loud. Just say it on the line. He knows you. He, he says, I know you. If I don't give you a clear standard to be accountable to me, you're going to wind up one day being accountable to somebody else. I know you. Right? He's saying, I know you, James. I know you. See, I know how slick you can get with this. I know how you're going to start chasing after conservative or liberal doctrine, and you're going to forget what I want. So I'm going to tell you right now what I want. I don't want you following a Democrat. I don't want you following a Republican. I don't want you doing that. I want you to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with me. It, he says, because I know you. Oh, I know you. He says, you get slick with it. I know you. You're going to forget about justice. So you're going to march to stop abortion. But you're going to oppose marching for Black Lives Matter. I know you. I know you. I know you. you, you, you I know you. You, 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 we, we all, y'all, all of us should be accountable to Jesus. Y'all, if we are black and white, conservatives, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, if we all were accountable to Jesus, then we could together promote a whole life agenda which would include justice for the baby in the womb as well as justice for the life in the world. But he says, but I know you. You don't want to on your own do justly. I know you. I know you. I know you. You're going to vote to impeach Bill Clinton over Monica Lewinsky. But you're going to support another president with moral failure by saying I'm voting for a president and not a pastor. I know you. God is saying, I know you. When you get a white Republican president, you're going to put on the sign of your church, pray for our president. But for the eight years you had a black and Democratic president, you didn't know anything about praying for the president. I know you. God said, I know you. I know you. You going to change your standard when different folk get in power. I know you. I know you. You're going to deny confirming Merlick Garling to the Supreme Court as a nominee after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia. But you're going to push forward Amy Coney Barrett as a nominee. I know you. I know you. I know you. I know you. He says, what does the Lord require? You need to get this in your spirit. You go ahead and be Republican or Democrat if you want. And there's a place not called heaven that's going to be reserved for you. Because down here on earth, my loyalty and my accountability is the man from Nazareth who died on a cross and loved me so much that he went to a tomb and was buried for me and rose again. At the end of the day, you don't have heaven nor hell to put me in. And at the end of the day, my accountability is to Jesus. And because of my accountability is to Jesus, he says, do justly. I can't, I, I, next Sunday, I'm going to give you love, mercy, walk humbly. I got justly today. That's my first point. 
My accountability, everybody say, my accountability is to Jesus. I'm going to say something that my own party, I'm on the ballot as a Democrat, my own party won't want me to say this. As Christians, we should never lead whether I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. What I am depends on the issue. I have an accountability to Jesus. That's the first big point today. My accountability is to Jesus. Here's the second big point. I only have two. The second big point is that there needs to be then actions. Everybody say actions. Actions of justice. <laughs> Staff. He does not say, pray justly. Yo, I'm letting y'all catch up. He does not say, preach justice. He does not say, talk justice. He, <laughs> he does not say, post justice. He doesn't say tweet. He doesn't say blog. Can I pause for a minute? You do realize posting about voting is not voting. Do y'all realize that? You, you do realize posting and tweeting about justice is not doing justice. He, everybody say do, do. He says do justice. God expects me to act. Write that down in your notes. Everybody say God expects me to act. He doesn't want me just tweeting about feeding hungry folk. He want me to feed hungry folk. He don't want me just talking about making, help, helping prisoners. He want me to visit prisoners. He wants me to refresh the thirsty. He wants me to clothe the naked. He wants me to heal the sick. He wants me to act to do justly. That means, let me tell you what it means. It means making fair decisions in our personal and in our business lives. Jot this down in your notes. This is a teaching sermon series because I want us to be alive. I want us to have the information we need. This is what he's saying. Lorenzo, what he's saying, have the same emphasis on social and institutional sins as we have on personal sins. I'm preaching good in here, y'all. He, he's saying, okay, so you don't cheat on your wife, but you cheat on your taxes. Okay, you never got divorced, but you don't pay people a livable wage. You don't offer them health insurance. The Old Testament, Micah, his accusation against Israel is summed up real simple in how the wealthy mistreated poor people. They had false measures. They cheated customers. They told lies. They kept the poor at a distance for personal gain. When you read the whole chapter, it is a tirade against the wealthy of the land, not against the poor. The reason was that the wealthy were responsible for the poverty of those around them. Whew. Let me just park for a moment. You're a Christian. You run a company. And you know, this, you know these guys cost you, these ladies cost you. You're cutting into my profit. And so, I can't keep paying you $22 an hour in benefits. Because if I pay you $22 an hour in benefits, my profit line is not $8.6 million. It's $2 million. I, I know what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to fire everybody that's making $22 an hour and getting benefits. And I'm going to hire them back through an employment service. I'm going to give the employment service $15 an hour with no benefits, and the employment service is going to pay you $12 an hour. You multiply that. I'm not sure I'm talking about Cummins, Firestone. I ain't scared. So we make, you know what United Healthcare's budget is? Their profit in one month. The same company that won't pay the benefits. The same company that says your co-pay to go to the ER is now $400 plus 20%. Do you know what their monthly profit is? I'm not talking about receipts. I'm talking about profit. Their monthly profit is a billion dollars a month. What does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly. I own a McDonald's, a Hardee's, a Burger King. I pay you $9 an hour. And I make sure you never get more than 32 hours. Because if you get more than 32 hours, then I have to pay you benefits. So instead of having all of this talk about all these jobs have been added to the economy, these are not jobs with livable wages and benefits. These are jobs to keep people poor. And here's my issue along with Micah, if you think I'm not in the text. God doesn't care as much about the business owner that does not proclaim his name. He is talking about the person that sings in the choir and ushers at the door and that runs the business and claims the name Jesus. And he is saying, I require of my people to do justly. He says, this is my problem with y'all. He says, you blaming them for their poverty. Boy, it's amazing how relevant the Bible is. Oh, you, you said they poor because they lazy. You said they're poor because they don't want to work. No, they're poor because you're not doing justly. I'm almost done. He's saying that's false worship. It is a farce that's designed to appease my guilt. So I offer God a bigger offering. I offer him some other. I do something to appease my guilt. I go on a mission trip to Nicaragua. These were people that were not paying just wages. They were not offering opportunity. They were criminalizing poverty. I know this is hard for y'all. I know it is. Because we want to put Jesus in the I pray good box. Jesus is saying, you can't put me in that box by myself. You got to, I'm a God of justice. I'll prove it to you in a minute when I'm done. He's saying, my accountability is to Jesus, and there ought be actions of justice. What can we put our hand on, our finger on, to prove we have been just? What can we do as believers? We think, because it's not us, we don't really think twice about that let me give y'all an example. There are cities in America that have made removing aluminum cans from trash cans a crime. Because we criminalize poverty. 
and if their, if their city has a recycling program. And because I'm homeless and broke, I pick up a can to get five cents for it. Now you've said I've stolen from the municipality because you can't recycle the can. You, 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 we don't think about it because it's not us. But that sign that says no loitering, where am I supposed to go if I'm homeless? The, the sign that says don't sleep on the park bench. You, you think it's good because I want my children to pay and play in the playground. I want them safe. And I want my children to play in the playground. I want them safe too. But when we criminalize poverty, do you know the high percentage of incarcerated people that have a mental health diagnosis? Because we have criminalized mental health concerns. Several years ago, I went with a group of people to the women's maximum security prison in Raleigh to preach. I don't really know what I was expecting. I think I was expecting a bunch of hardcore, like just me, like you belong here kind of thing. Preaching and say this, sis, tell me a story. You, you seem... Wonderful. She said, I was hanging out late, drinking, went to a party, and I got stopped on DUI. And they put me in prison, and I couldn't post bail. So I had to stay in until my trial date. I had to stay in during my trial date, and while I was in here, I lost my job. While I was in here, I lost custody of my daughter. And I didn't really fit in, so they picked a fight with me. I picked a, they picked a fight with me. I got in a fight. The person that I got in a fight with just to protect myself bumped their head, and they wound up in a coma. And I got tried for manslaughter. And now I've got a 13-year sentence. She was only there because she couldn't afford to post bail. Does that sound like justice? What does the Lord require of us but to do justice? I one more thing, I'm done. I can't get justice without diverse judges. Our current president has appointed 200 appointments to the federal judiciary. The federal judiciary makes up, it's the Supreme Court, the 13 regional appeals courts, and the 91 district courts. That's the federal judiciary. In his first term, he already would have made more appointments than other presidents in two terms. This is what I want you to see. Of his 51 appointments at the second highest court in the land, the appeals courts, the 13 regional appeals courts, there have been 51 appointments. Under President Obama, 27% of his appointments at that level were black. Under George W. Bush, 15% of his appointments at that level were black. Under President Trump, 0% are black. It is the first time since Richard Nixon that a sitting president has not appointed an African-American to the second highest court in the land. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly? If 
For those of you who think I veered too far off the scriptures, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus is where justice and mercy meets. The letter of Hebrews makes it clear. Since God is perfectly just, he could not allow sin to go unpunished. So he hears the cries of those suffering injustice and he promises to intervene. Psalm 7 says, arise, Lord, in your anger, rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. This is why the atonement that Jesus provided was necessary. Because there is a sense in which God's simply forgiving or simply decreeing salvation is not a possibility if he's just. The wages of sin is death. So if he does not punish sin, then by implication, God is unjust. If he does not punish sin, he is ultimately untrustworthy. So Jesus has to die because God serves, God is a just God. If we are imagio dei, made in his image, then we also must be just. And all I've tried to say today is that as Christians, we have to do justly. I can't tell you how to vote or who to vote for. I can tell you Micah 6, 8 should be in your head and heart when you do vote. I want to pray for justice. I want to pray for justice. I want you to join me in praying for justice. How many of y'all would, how many of you would jump on an airplane right now if the statistics said, the data, one out of every five planes crashed? How many of us would honestly take a chance? Because I'm, I'm out there at the airport and I'm doing one, two, three, four, five. I want you to hear this. Statistically, one out of every five people on death row is innocent. The main reason I oppose the death penalty is because I know for every five people we kill, one was innocent. And until we get a better system, we should just stop. What does the Lord require of you but to do to do justly? Let's pray together. Lord, this is a heavy time in the life of our nation. We desperately need you. Today, God, my prayer is about justice. Pray for justice, God, for the men and women who have lost their lives. I know, God, that you are a God of justice. And so, God, anything that is in our nation that is sinful, anything that is in our nation that doesn't honor you or please you, I pray that by your spirit, you would enable us as your people, God, to deal with it. God, thank you for life. Thank you for human life. And God, we are different, but yet I pray that there will be justice in our land, justice that, God, innocent people will not be killed, justice, so that those who are guilty will be sentenced, justice, so that those who are innocent will be exonerated, justice, so that people can have a livable wage, justice, so that there's not predatory lending in our communities, justice, so that women are paid equal to a man, justice. God, my prayer is for justice in the land. And I pray, God, 
that as believers, God, we will come against any spirit of partisanship or division. And we would simply, God, want to be believers that are held accountable to you. God, one day we're all going to stand before you. I'm going to give an account, God, of how I treated every person, not just my clique, not just my crew. But God, you're going to hold me accountable for how I treated God, those that were in poverty, how I treated those that are homeless, how I treated those that were hungry, how I treated God. And you're going to hold me accountable, God. And if I, if I own a business, if I run a business, you're going to hold me accountable, God. Could I have done anything? Could I have paid them differently? Could I have provided opportunity for them? Could I have done anything differently? God, I'm going to stand before you one day. God, would you forgive us when our worship is a fake before you? No, I can't come before you with just a bigger offering and get by. No, I can't come before you with a better song and get by. No, I can't come before you being more resolute and more certain. No, I can't come before you with any of that and you be good. I've got to do justly. So, God, don't forgive us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for how I treat the people that work for me and with me, and yet I claim your name. Forgive me that in my business I, I claim to be a Christian, and yet I, 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 I shoot up my prices higher than necessary. Forgive me that I'm a Christian, but I run up, run up the rate of interest on the loan. Forgive me, God, for our worship being fake. Now, God, would you bring us to a place of conviction and a place of change? So, God, would you help us to be your voice, your hands, your feet? Help me, God, to not just talk it and tweet it and blog it and post it. Help me to live it. Help me to want the same for my brother who's not my race. My brother that doesn't have my same social background. My sister that is not my gender. Help me, God, to do justly. That's my prayer, God. Now, God, if there are people who have not yet made a decision, God, I know they've had a chance earlier today. But God, if they're listening, they're watching without a relationship with you, without a church home where they can grow, without a place where the truth of your scriptures are being presented, would you cause them right now, God, draw them to you to say, I want to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus.